We'll sing the first verse of the next hymn, 406, more about Jesus would I know. Just the verse 1 and the chorus and we'll stand to sing. <laughs> justified by faith and therefore have peace with God. Grant that needed help of the Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 In her devotional book, Streams in the Desert, Mrs. Kyman tells a story of a soldier who had returned from war. And as this soldier returned from war, he spoke of how during his time in the trenches, he had come across a young Christian who he had found reading God's Word. And the soldier engaged the young soldier in conversation. He said to him that he had tried the Bible many times, but it had never done anything for him. And the young man was reading from John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. And he sought to relay some of the message of this chapter to the older soldier. But the unconverted soldier, he exhorted the young man to give up trying to find hope in the Bible. But the young Christian replied, if you knew what this meant to me, you would never ask me to give it up. And the soldier said, as the young man replied, his face was glowing as he spoke of how precious God's word in this chapter was to him. Sometime later, a bomb fell near this particular place. And the older soldier went back to where he had seen the younger man earlier. And he discovered that the young soldier was fatally wounded. They had a brief conversation together before the young man died. The older soldier took the copy of the Word of God that young man had and he himself was converted. And after the war, he said, the most wonderful thing I've ever experienced during the war was the light on that young soldier's face. The light, the glow of that young soldier's face. And surely that man had experienced, that is the young soldier, had experienced the reality of the chapter that he had been reading. 
Uh, there he was in a time of great turmoil, surrounded by trouble and death. And yet as he read in this chapter, peace I leave with you, the young man had that peace in the middle of the turmoil. That the older soldier recognized that was not something that he had. But thankfully he came to experience it for himself. James Montgomery Boyce tells a story of an art competition. And the challenge in this particular art competition was to provide an artwork on the subject of peace. And many of the different works that were submitted to that competition were from pastoral type scenes, country scenes, and so there were beautiful flowers, animals and so on. But the winning submission was actually a painting of a very violent waterfall. And you try to picture that in your mind, all of the turbulence, all of the noise, even the spray. But beside that waterfall was a great tree. And some of the branches of the tree extended out over the waterfall. And one of those branches was a bird's nest. And inside was a sleeping bird. And there was the peace. You see, all around was noise and turbulence. But yet the little bird was sleeping at peace, peace in the midst of the storm. And that's really the peace that the Lord is describing here in our text. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. And the Lord is not promising that everything here on in is going to be easy. Rather, over in chapter 16 and the verse 33, the Lord promises tribulation. But in chapter 16, verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And the Lord is saying to his disciples, even in those times when you experience great trouble, even as some of you will be martyred for your faith, be of good cheer. I leave you peace. I give you peace. A, a peace that the world knows nothing about. A peace that the world can never give. So as Christ ministered to his disciples here in the upper room, in some ways it was like a, a deathbed scene. Christ was given his farewell sermon in many ways. Speaking to them before his death. And the disciples, of course, like anybody gathered around the bedbed, they wished that it were not the farewell sermon. They wished that they could keep the Lord. But the Lord was explaining it was for their good that he would go. And he came to the matter of his legacy. What would he leave them? There's no promise of money. There's no promise of lands. But there's a promise of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Remember how he said, I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter. He will give you another Apparently, that's what I will give you. And we saw last time, the Lord said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans. We come to this verse then, but I will leave you peace. I will give you peace. I am giving you peace. After a loved one passes, you may receive some heirloom. You take that out every so often and you look at it, you treasure it. Here is something very precious the Lord has given to the people of God. My peace I give unto you.
peace I leave with you. This is the Lord's great legacy to his church. And the great promise here is one that never goes out of date. Are there ever times that you grow fearful like these disciples were? Are there ever times that you're full of apprehension as these disciples were? Are there ever times that you feel agitated? I'm sure all of us come to times like that. And how in times like that when everything seems to be against us, we are to turn to these words and take great comfort, peace. Leave with you. Yes, there'll be times of trouble, times of difficulty, at times when you will fear what the future holds for you and the work of God, but Christ says there'll be a great healing by my peace. And so I've entitled the message Christ's Gift of Peace. I want to say, first of all, with you, a peace in God's presence. Peace in God's presence. The Lord is saying, while I will not be with you physically, I am going away. While I will not be with you physically, I will be with you spiritually. As the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells in you, I will thereby be with you. So you're not going to be alone. You're not going to be orphans. The Comforter will come. If you look with me, please, in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. And so there is this great promise that the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, he is going to come. And we read something similar a few weeks back in verse 16, that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will come. Now look with me then at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him. The Father and the Son. And so Christ is saying that as he goes away, the Spirit will come. As he comes, the Father will also be with God's people. The Son will be with God's people. And the whole Trinity then, as it were, is brought to the believer on the basis of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have them, and as the believer has the peace of the Father, the great author of peace. We have the peace of the Son, the great anchor great purchaser of peace. And we have the peace of the Holy Spirit, the applier of peace. In the midst of troubles that overwhelm the Christian, he is to sense this, the Lord is with me. I am not alone. The Lord is with me. I am not alone. And this great present of peace then is based on the presence of the great peacemaker with us, the great peace giver with us. On New Year's Day in 1861, John Patton and some other missionaries that were with him took medicine to the tribe's people on the island of Tana in the what was then called the New Hebrides, Vanuatu today. There was at that time an outbreak of measles. And the missionaries, they came back to their, the place where their homes were built. And they had a time of prayer and a time of worship unto the Lord. And as the time of prayer and so on had come to a close, one of the young missionaries was returning to his own home, just across the way a little bit. And one of the tribesmen had come and sought to pound upon him. And for a while, many of the tribal people had received the medicine and had been helped by it. There were many of the tribes people that were very suspicious. And they blamed the missionaries for all the troubles on the island. 
And as that young missionary was attacked, John Patton was able to call uh, to the angry tribesman. He said, Jehovah God sees you and will punish you for trying to murder his servants. Uh, and the man then ran off into the bush. But Patton said, during the crisis, I felt calm and firm of soul. Standing erect with my whole weight on the promise, Lo, I am with you always. And though tension on the island grew and grew after that particular day, yet Patton wrote of how he continued to have a sense of great peace. He said, The precious promise, the secret of a calm soul. The secret of a joyous heart they promised to stand on. The promise to lean one's whole weight upon. Lo, I am with you always. And tonight, dear believer, as we read these words, peace I leave with you. In our various struggles, we are to take this as a great promise that the Lord is with us. We are not alone. And at times maybe we don't know what is going to become of us. But the Lord is with us. If we have Him, we have all. Peace in God's presence. But I want to say then, secondly, there's peace in God's purchase. Now Christ says here, my peace I give unto you. And so the Lord gives peace, but then He uh, re-emphasized here, it's my peace that I give you. And I want you to think for a moment or two then that as the Lord calls this my peace, it is a peace that he has purchased for us. Or as he was speaking to the disciples, was about to purchase for them. And then met over to them. As he was speaking of his coming death, it would be in his death that he would purchase peace as this great legacy to give unto his disciples, so the hour was growing darker. In verse 30, he talks about the prince of this world coming. That is, he is soon to come to the cross. But as he senses this great darkness coming, he says to his disciples, I give you my As he thought of this great purchase, the purchase gave the assurance of the gift of peace. The assurance of the gift of peace. The Lord really was saying, I must die in order that you would enjoy that peace. Uh, that reminded me of words in Hebrews chapter 9, where uh, the writer there is speaking of how in the earthly realm, when we think of a will, a final testament. It comes into force when the person dies. Hebrews chapter 9, 15. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, that by means of death, uh, sorry, that by means of death. Verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And so someone could have written in their will that they are going to give to you a, a great estate. But it will never be yours until there is the death of the testator. Verse 17, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth and uh, Paul then is describing here that all of the great promises of the gospel have come to be ours through the Lord's death. Now as we think of this matter of the legacy of peace, as Christ said, my peace I leave with you, it would only be theirs as the Lord would give himself in his death. And as he would die, and as he would show the effectiveness, the success of his death and his resurrection, it would be then that they would have this great assurance that this legacy really was theirs. This peace is for us. The Lord has guaranteed it 
in his death. So the purchase gave the assurance of the gift of peace. And the purchase revealed the authenticity of the gift of peace. And notice what our text says, peace I leave with you. And this is verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. And surely the implication of those words is that there is some sort of peace that the world gives. It's not the real deal. But there is a peace that the world offers. And people today, of course, will make payments hoping to achieve peace. They will take out the greatest insurance policy to have peace of mind. They will pay what they can to have a particular treatment, to have peace that health would be guaranteed to them. Or it could be some will turn to drink or drugs or some other thing to have peace. Take this and all your troubles seem to disappear. And so there's a price involved. But it doesn't really pay out. It doesn't bring the thing that the person actually longs for. Or it could be amusement. I didn't realise until last week that the root meaning of the word amusement really has the idea of no thought, no thinking. And we use the word Muse, I muse on something, I think about it, I meditate upon it. Or some people go to a museum. And what is a museum? The actual origin of that word is at, at the seat of musing. It's a place to think. But what do many turn to? They turn to amusement, that is, no thinking. No thinking. And the world will say then, clear your mind. Forget about your problem. Go and have a good time. Of course, the problem is when you come back from your supposed good time, the problem is still there. You might have been distracted for an hour or two, but you haven't got peace. The problem exists. And of course, this is one of the great dangers in uh, so-called amusement worship. Where it's taking God's people away from thinking. But God's people are exhorted to think. We are to gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, and so how are we to know peace? Well, it, it's not by amusement. There must be much thinking. And but here then, as we think of this peace, the world will try to find it in various places, but Christ, he comes and he says, you need my peace, my peace. A peace purchased through the cross, anything else will not do. And how many today who are not converted, they are hoping to find peace, and the sinner can even though some degree of peace outside of Christ, he can convince himself there's no judgment. He can convince himself that he is good enough to appear before God. And so he has some type of peace, but it's a foolish peace. Because he has been pacified by falsehood, not by truth. Harry Ansai told the story of how one day as he was walking down the street he saw a blind man ahead of him. And the blind man did not have a stick. The blind man did not have a guide dog because he had walked that street so many times he was confident he knew it. But Ironside could see that up ahead that a manhole had been lifted up and so there was a hole in the paving down into a basement. And Ironside realised that if the man kept walking, he was going to fall into that hole in the pavement. And therefore he grabbed hold of the man. And Ironside was saying the man was at peace. 
He was quite confident that he was safe. He had walked the pavement many times. But his peace was not founded on something that was true. And so the sinner today are like so many in the days leading up to the captivity of Jerusalem. They hear the false prophet saying, peace, peace. There is no judgment. But the truth is, for that sinner there is no peace. And so Paul could say, the way of peace they have not known. They have a false peace. They have not known the true peace. And so Christ says to the unconverted, here is an offer of peace. Come to Christ. And we read earlier in Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And here's the peace for the sinner then. It's in Christ. It's in saving faith. And the sinner then is to come to Christ in faith and repentance. And Paul says as the sinner is brought to saving faith in Christ, he is justified. And on the basis of that justification, there is peace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. The scripture speaks of peace in this sense in two ways. There is what we could call a legal peace. A transaction piece or a forensic piece. That is, as the sinner comes to Jesus Christ for salvation, as he is justified, he has peace in heaven. His name is written there. He's the Lord's child. He's saved. And so there's peace with God. And every believer then has that legal forensic peace. But then scripture speaks of another peace. Experiential peace. Peace of conscience. That peace that passes all understanding. It is related to joy. Remember how in Romans 15, 13 it speaks there of the God of hope filling you with all joy and peace in believing. Joy and peace in believing. And so here is a peace that is on the earth. That is peace in the heart of the believer. You see, it's possible for one to be to have peace in heaven. They have come and they have rested in Christ, they are saved. And yet their heart is full of doubt. And so they don't have peace on earth. There's peace in heaven. They are right before a holy God in that legal sense. But they have not peace on earth. And surely as the Lord said here, peace I leave with you, peace I give unto you. He meant it in the twofold sense. That the work of the gospel brings peace between man and God. But it also brings peace between man and his own heart. Where man recognises that yes, my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, but my confidence is in Christ and his cross. That God is greater than my heart. The work of Christ is greater than my heart. And John Macduff, a great Scottish preacher, he I quoted some words, Oh, that I might effectually recommend to you the full possession of that pre precious legacy of our blessed Saviour. Peace. And really he was saying, Dear believer, enjoy the gospel that has saved you. Recognize your position in Christ. Deal with your Enjoy the peace. Enjoy the peace. Isn't it interesting that the Lord spoke to the disciples here in the upper room. Before his death he promised them peace. If you could look over a couple of pages to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verse 19 on the 
resurrection day in the evening time. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And now these disciples had a legal peace they were saved. And yet they were full of fear. And the Lord, he immediately was showing them the peace that I purchased for you is to be enjoyed. And here I am. He revealed himself as the risen Savior. Peace be unto you. In verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. Remember how Thomas was not there that day. And as he came later and met with the disciples, he would not believe. And imagine the disciples trying to convince him, Thomas, we are now at peace. Christ indeed is alive. He has risen. The thing that he talked about in the upper room before his death is being experienced by us now. Thomas still didn't have it. At the end of verse 26, the Lord appears a week later and says, Peace be unto you. Thomas, now you enjoy this peace as well. There's peace in God's purchase. But I want to say finally tonight, there's peace in God's purpose. Isn't the whole context in which the Lord spoke these words so amazing? As Christ was speaking these words to his disciples, Judas had gone to the religious leaders. And they were plotting how they were going to be able to arrest Jesus and put him to death. Now can you imagine yourself, if you knew that at this very moment there were people plotting and organizing the arrangements for your death, could you calmly deliver a discourse like this, John 14 to 16? Could you calmly go and pray the words of John 17? And what was Christ doing? He was showing the very thing that he was talking about. And so Jonathan Edwards pointed out that as Christ spoke here of my peace, it's not just the peace that he purchased, but he was talking about the peace that he had demonstrated and was demonstrating. I've shown you peace. My peace I give unto you. And he's really saying to them then, through my ministry you witness peace. Sometimes you even marveled at my peace. But I'm giving it to you now, so that others will marvel at the peace that you have in the midst of great trouble. And so the Lord had said, I will give you another comforter, an advocate. And remember how I pointed out to you that the Lord had been an advocate to the disciples. And he's now saying, the Spirit will be an advocate for you. I have shown you peace. But now as I go away and the Spirit comes, you will have peace. You'll have my peace. The Holy Ghost will make you to know it. Remember after the feeding of the 5,000, the Lord put his disciples into a boat. The Lord knew that a great storm was coming. The disciples evidently hadn't realized. And the Lord instructed them to go to the other side. But as they were making that journey across the lake, the great wind came. And they tried all night to get to the other side. They tried in vain. And in the fourth watch, that's the last part of the evening, last part of the night, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus was walking upon the sea. He would have passed by him. He was calm. He was showing peace. Mark 6 verse 15 says, For they all saw him and were troubled. 
And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. As if he was saying, You see me, I'm in the midst of this storm, and I'm not afraid. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And when he got into the boat and the wind ceased, they were then calm. But the Lord had been at peace all the time. I remember that other storm experience that the disciples had where the Lord was sleeping in the boat. It was the great storm. And yet the Lord, with that peace, he was sleeping. He was calm. Or consider also that time when the Jews wanted to push the Lord over the cliff. Remember how he calmly walked his way through the crowds. Or even in the garden, though there were those great drops of blood, and as he contemplated all that lay ahead, yet he still was able to say, Thy let thy will be done, thy will be done, not mine. We have to ask the question: how was it that Christ demonstrated such peace? Because he was resting on the purpose of the Father. He knew it was the Father's will that he must go to the cross. Therefore, he could not die by being pushed over a cliff. He could not die by drowning in a storm in the lake of Galilee. And his confidence then was in the purpose of the Father. And so the Lord says now to his disciples, My peace I give to you. You are to have confidence in the purpose of the Father. Not one hair of yours will be singed without it being in the very purpose of God. Not one trial will come your way without it being in the purpose of God. And the Lord surely is saying at times you may even be concerned for the future of the work of God. But God has purposed that his church will be built. And therefore, no matter what the opposition against the church of God is, ultimately that opposition is going to come to nothing. Their schemes will fail because Christ will see to it that the church is built. Christ will see to it that his a great plan will come to its fruition. And therefore the Lord is really saying to his disciples here, enjoy this peace. If you could turn with me to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And I think in this chapter we get something of that big picture. Acts chapter 10 where Peter um, is to bring the gospel to the house of Cornelius indicating that the gospel has been brought to the Gentiles. Remember how the keys were given to Peter? And so the door had been opened to Jerusalem. As far as the gospel was concerned, the door had been opened to the Samaritans. Now the door was to be opened to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, verse 36. And Peter says here, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace, by Jesus Christ. And so during the ministry of Christ, he was one that preached peace. Verse 38, Peter speaks of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He was enabled to fulfill his ministry of preaching peace. But notice then verse 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people. And to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Christ came preaching peace. And Peter says, now we are sent to preach. And the message is the same. It's the message of peace. And thereby, as we preach and bring the message of peace, we are to be a people who enjoy the very peace that 
we talk about. As we exhort sinners to come to a peace that is beyond all understanding, we preach daily to our own hearts. The Lord has given us peace. Just one final thought in our text in John chapter 14, uh, the verse 27. Christ said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. You there is plural. I give it unto all eleven of you, because all eleven of you are afraid. There are times when God's people are in fear, at times when their mind is at fullest where with storm. And they get this idea, what an awful Christian I must be. Why am I feeling like this? Well, I suggest to you, if you feel like that, put yourself there in the upper room scene, you would be in good company. There were eleven disciples. And they were afraid. There were eleven disciples, and they ought, ought to have been at great peace, and yet they were disturbed. And the Lord came, he said, My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He brings them right back to the beginning of the chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. And... How are we to respond then to this text tonight? We are to faith afresh in Christ. Our whole confidence is to be afresh in the gospel, to take comfort and to apply it. Then to obey those words of Colossians 3.15, let peace rule in your heart. Let peace rule in your heart. The word rule there has the idea of arbitrate. Arbitrate. That is, let the gospel provide the arguments. When we're afraid, we're filling our minds with the arguments that we hear all around us. How does peace rule our hearts? As the gospel arbitrates. As the gospel provides the great arguments, this is the reason why you can be peaceful in the middle of turbulence. May we then be as that bird in the nest, knowing peace while all around us is turbulence. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts. Amen. We're going to turn in closing, please, to the words of Horatio Spafford, 351, 351, because we think of the subject of peace, I'm sure this is a hymn that comes to our minds, when peace like a river tendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford penned these words as he was passing across the Atlantic Ocean. He passed across the spot where his daughters had perished in a tragic accident. As he reflected upon the great grief that he had in his heart, he spoke of this peace. It is well with my soul. 351 will stand as we sing in closing.